name is Paul Dickinson. I'm Vice President uh, for Presence Technology North America. Um, and what we are going to discuss today, the sign on the door had a little bit of a typo onto it. We're not, we're not going to discuss how to achieve a 200 seat contact center using asterisks. We're, talking, we're going to talk about achieving a 2,000 seat contact center using asterisks. Okay? Um, and so that's the topic for today. So we're going to go through, and um, this is not going to be a, a commercial specifically for my company, but I am going to give you a little background on my company to understand where we came from and why we did what we did as far as moving to the Asterix platform, okay? All right, so this is me again, once again, and, our, and you guys can all get a copy of this um, uh, presentation as well, too. I'm sure it'll be available to you, so I'll do a different way of contacting our companies here um, and contacting me as well. All right, and so we're gonna start with the first thing we're gonna start with is who we are, okay? And I'm gonna tell you, once in a while, you're gonna see kind of some funny way of saying things up there, because Alfredo, who I, I was supposed to be here giving this talk, well, he's, um, he had to end up going to Spain at the last minute, and so he wrote this in his Spanish way. And so every once in a while, you're gonna see a funny use of words, so please excuse those right now. All right, so who we are. All right, so what, what we do and who we are is we manufacture a full contact center suite um, it's every part of the contact center with the exception of WFO, um, but we make the inbound, outbound, call scripting, call recording, screen capture, full IVR with ASR, TTS functionality, multimedia integration, um, web chat integration. So the whole solution, um, we, we package it all into what we call a customer engagement center where all of our channels give visibility of every other channel in the process as well too. So this is what we've actually come to, to be able to do today. We've been doing for the last five, six years, but I'm gonna, um, that, and that's our present uh, product right now. Um, we have about 230 some clients in 20 different countries. We're actually closer to 100,000 seats now worldwide. It's a little bit older presentation. Um, and we also have a, um, a variety of uh, value-added resellers. Um, we offer both an on-premise and a cloud solution for our product. Okay. Um, now, how do we start? And this is an important thing. Like a lot of the other technology industries, we did not actually start in a garage. We started a whole different way. Now, I know it's kind of foreign to um, technology startups here who typically start in garages. Um, but we started actually as part of a very large BPO out of Spain, okay? So basically what it was is, if we look at this, we had, um, there was a BPO in Spain that had some 3,000 seats, and they were running into a scenario where they had problems doing what they really wanted to do with the contact center, okay? Um, they, had the, they had the need to increase the productivity on their outbound uh, capabilities for this BPO. Um, and the, what they were doing evaluations of figuring out how do we move to an outbound solution? What do we need to do? Well, they ran some challenges. They ran into the challenges that a lot of the solutions were hardware based, which meant another huge investment in a non proprietary system or non open system or another system that was going to be something that they were going to be locked into. They were going to have to buy hardware, maintain that hardware. Um, and in the BPO market, that's just a very difficult thing to do. Um, your margins are slim, your customers are not continuous, so you might have a customer for six months, you might have a customer for a year, but then they go away. Now if you've got, you know, if you've got a huge investment in hardware and a huge investment on a platform, um, you have nothing to pay for at that point. So they were kind of making a lot of decisions of what do we do for the outbound market? Um, and so what they decided to do is they, they had an internal team that were developers and they already had an existing Avaya um, uh, system at that point. And they knew that the Avaya system had a good CTI platform. Um, and so what they ended up doing is using their developers to actually custom create um, a dialer solution um, that would actually give them a predictive and a preview uh, solution, okay? And so basically they wrote this product, developed it, and started using it. And about a, after about a year of uh, full production of the system, they realized that they had some huge, huge productivity gains, and, and, and they were able to do a lot of growth within their BPO market, okay? 
Um, the other thing that they found, which was critical to them, is they found that they were able to, or we found that we were able to at this point, um, actually change our uh, cost structure, change how we were able to actually bill the uh, NB NBPO customers, going from a time per agent model to an event, pay per event based model. And they were able to do that by developing this software. Okay? And originally, they did it through, a, through an Avaya integration. So basically, the Avaya had the PBX, they had the CTI layer, the AES server, the TCAP licenses. Um, so they had those pieces of it existing. And in our suite, what they developed was this integration into it that had the CTI level, um, had a software development kit that they were actually able to integrate into it. Um, and they were also able to use this piece to integrate into the CRM so they could actually do intelligent um, uh, dialing solutions for the customer. Okay? So this is kind of an overview of what it looks like um, in that environment where you had the, the VIA PBX, the VIA talked to all the SIP trunks, did all the voice things, all the sets, all the trunking, everything was done by the Avaya switch. We actually, through our, um, our presence server, were actually using, able to use the AES server to do commands on um, the trunks to dial, use the call classifier boards to um, do the detection, and then actually have the uh, vectoring of the, uh, of the Avaya system come back in, place it to the agent, and then use our software and our SDKs to integrate the screen pops and the solution into the back end systems. So that's what they did, okay? Um, and it worked, and they did this in 2001. Was after they got all that done, the company got bought out by a big company called Teletech. And when Teletech bought them out, so they said, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep the BPO, and we're gonna spin off this software we developed as its own company. That became who we are today, Presence, okay? That was in 2001 that they did that. Um, and so we've been around since that point. Um, the problem was, they had a good customer base out there that um, they could go after on the Avaya-based customers, but there was a whole large set of other companies out there that they wanted to be able to offer integrations to. They wanted to go up to the marketplace with their solution, but the problem became that all these different solutions, at the time, the Nortel, the Ericsson, the Shortels, Panasonic, all these other solutions did not have a common CTI connector for us to be able to develop this against, right? We did a couple of small integrations. We did for a while with the Nortel through the Meridian Link system, but that wasn't as successful. We did also another development through Ericsson, but we realized, hey, here's a problem here. We're gonna spend hundreds of thousands of dollars per uh, implementation process or per development process trying to make a product that we could actually go out and integrate into other non-Avaya-based systems. And you know, there were, with no guarantee we were ever gonna sell them either. So there was, that was a big solution. So we looked at that and go, what do we wanna do moving forward? What can we do moving forward? So in 2004, we decided we need more market share, we need other customers to go after, we need to go after other bases out there besides the Avaya, how do we do it? That was when we made the decision um, well, actually, just before we made that decision, let's talk about what we needed. We needed the solution that could work with any PBX. We, needed, we didn't want to do 1,000 developments. We wanted one development that we could actually go and say, we can make you work with your Nortel, we make you work with your Cisco, make you work um, with your Shortel, with whatever system's out there, okay? We also wanted something that we knew a lot of customers out there had a bunch of different versions of systems. So you might have one large enterprise customer has a, a, an Avaya here, has a Cisco one on, on the West Coast, has, you know, ha, has Nortels they haven't upgraded you know, uh, up in um, um, the South and so forth. And we wanted to be able to uh, develop a system that could be one unifying system on a contact center base for all those customers, okay? So that was another consideration because we knew that that was a big common thing happening out in the marketplace. Um, we wanted to, once again, we didn't want to have the whole development cost per system, um, and we wanted to have a normalized requirement architecture across all the PBXs. We also wanted something that could be a standalone product. We wanted to be able to sell um, the customer, uh, to customers that all they needed was a contact center. And understand, at this point in our, in our thought process, um, outbound was still our major piece of business, okay? And a lot of times in outbound, Outbounds, it can be a standalone center. 
They, a lot of times that's all they need to be is just a center by itself. They don't need part of a bigger PBX and so forth because that type of a business is just set to you know, sit the guy in the seat, shoot the calls out when he's available, hit him with the call. He's not worried about checking voicemail. He's not worried about doing a lot of other things that, that multi-blended agents typically do today. And so in that part of it, we were looking at um, wanting to have a standalone system as well. Um, we also wanted things that we could actually um, do a lot of um, um, uh, the marketplace to turn to a lot of teleworkers. We wanted something that we could actually incorporate agents that were working from home, working remote, things to that effect. So in that case, um, we wanted that solution as well too. So that, that was uh, a lot of the requirements that we had. We also wanted to make sure that we didn't have to maintain hardware. That was a big thing, okay? Right now, a lot of the vendors out there, even today, the, one of the problems is you have to buy their hardware. And their hardware is not cheap. You think about turning up a VM instance for an application right now, you know what the set price point is. Because you have your negotiated, your customers have your negotiated pricing with your vendors on the hardware. You want to go buy a, a, an Avaya system, you're paying three times, a lot of times, for that same hardware that you could buy by yourself. Or another base system, I don't want to pick on Avaya specifically, but other com companies that actually their hardware is what they sell. They're making their money off their hardware. So we knew that we didn't want to do that because, you know, one of the problems with that is, you know, maintaining it. If it goes bad, you have to fix it. Uh, so we wanted a complete software solution where we could develop the application, fix our application, but if there was a hardware piece to failure to it, the customer's better equipped at handling that than we would ever be. So, um, and we wanted to use native voice, uh, uh, voice over IP um, with a, a extensive codec support, and we wanted, we knew we needed it to be scalable. We needed to be able to uh, sell something that would support a large number of seats. So, this is where we made the decision to standardize our solution on Asterix. Okay? The reason we wanted to do it is A, it was open source. It was something that we could actually utilize um, on a very common uh, architecture across multiple users. Um, it already had the core features we needed. It had the codex, it had the protocols, it had a CTI capability, it had a dialing plan. It, had the, it was the voice engine that we needed um, to be able to control to make our solution work the way we wanted it to. Um, it's a very large community. It's a very accepted standard. Um, when we did it in 2004, it was not as accepted as today, but it was a good call on our part because it has become so accepted um, worldwide today. Um, you know, it used to be a scenario where years ago it was hard to get anybody other than visionaries to really look at the Asterix platform as something uh, that could be very beneficial to a corporation. Um, there wasn't a lot of people trained on it. There wasn't a lot of people who understood how to develop it. Um, th that market wasn't there, but today it's not the case. You, you've got pretty much all companies throughout the world that are looking at Asterix as a major benefit uh, to their voice platform within their corporations. Now, they may not do it mass load as far as a full enterprise-based um, solution. Some of them do, some of them don't, but all of them now have realized one way or the other there's a major benefit of having Asterix as a part of their voice platform within their corporations. Okay, so. For us, looking at that at that time, making that decision as opposed to developing our own voice platform or looking at something else as a platform, for us it was a very good decision we found out long term, okay? Um, we could also reduce our efforts on implementation. The nice thing about it too is if it was our own platform we developed, we were gonna have to train our own people on implementing the asterisk piece of it, or understand how to maintain it, so forth, so we decided that because it was so standardized out there and accepted, we would have more people that were able to work on that piece of it for us if required. Um, and the cost was obviously another major, major piece to it as well too, because you know, we could buy a, plat a voice platform and incorporate it into it, we could develop our own, but the open source of Asterix really fit well with what we were trying to do. Okay. All right, so what we decided to do in this is we, we could use this platform and we can make it um, compatible with any PBX type out there, okay? Here's what we did differently, and I'm gonna jump a little bit ahead on this, but we knew that we were gonna have to do some very specific things with this platform. We knew that we were gonna have to grow large because all of our customers were tending to be larger implementations. We knew um, that um, 
um, we were going to also have to be able to control specifically um, how the calls worked uh, and be able to actually control um, what the processing capabilities of the servers were going to be, what the CPU load, CPU load on everything was going to be. Um, and so what we decided to do, as opposed to using a lot of the routing features and a lot of the actual um, uh, ACD features and the, and, and the uh, queuing features of the asterisk itself, we decided we were actually going to go into a scenario where we use comp uh, Meet Me Conference Bridges as our solution for a contact center. Okay? And the reason for this is because what could happen is if we had the agent actually nail up the bridge, we could, do, we could, we could talk to anything. So when we, we, we integrate our solution into a short tail system, and we have a large implementation on the West Coast with that, we're actually integrating um, uh, via SIP trunks between our solution and short tail, and when an agent logs in, the, the process automatically goes in and it, it launches a call through the SIP trunk to the agent and nails up that agent. Uh, it's a short tail phone that's nailed up. The headset's plugged into the short tail phone, but we actually nailed up and controlled that scenario. Okay? So it's there nailed up on a, on a Meet Me conference, and then what we will do is we will use our logic and our intelligence when a call comes into us either through the short tail, through a SIP trunk, through a redirect, or to a direct um, a SIP carrier or to a gateway that's connected to a PRI, we bring it into our system, we use our logic, and we actually connect that through another Meet Me conference to that agent every time. And if you see the logic in doing that scenario, it can be anything we connect to. We can register SIP sets directly to our, uh, to our asterisk servers, or what we call our open gate servers. We can actually have our agent actually make a phone call across the PSTN to a set at somebody's house and let, nail that up and actually have that as an agent. Um, we can do that through a PBX, like we did at the short tail, to a set there and nail that up. So in that scenario, once that agent's established, um, then we have the full control of that agent and we, all we have to do is do meet me conferences to that agent um, uh, from an inbound call. Or if we're making an outbound call, same thing. Our, our asterisk server or our open gate server through our presence system generates the calls. Once we do the detection and we bat that detection there, we immediately through a meet me conference, boom, connect, connect them to that whatever agent's available based upon our looking at that. So if you see this here, in this scenario, it shows you that we're actually connecting an agent to an outside third party PBX phone through a meet me conference and then the trunk comes in through the PSTN and also connects to that same meet me conference. Um, in this scenario right here, this is the same type of scenario where we're actually registering a set um, directly to our um, open gate server, and then our trunking is also coming through that same open gate server or another open gate server and connecting to it. Okay. Same thing here uh, through the PSTN, just different versions of how we could do that. All right. So, Let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of using the Meet Me conference as the, as the architecture to develop our system. Well, the advantage is, is it works in every scenario. I can integrate SIP trunk to a existing PBX. I can integrate to a um, existing PBX through PRIs. I can just put a gateway in between the two of them, connect that gateway to the PRI, and then, um, and the, and then to, to my um, system through, SIP, uh, through SIP, SIP trunks and just make sure the dialing plan is in place. I can make calls out to a public switch network phone. I can register phones directly. So uh, there wasn't a solution uh, or, or a product out there that some way or another I couldn't integrate my product into. Um, service observing became very easy because all the, agent, all the supervisor had to do was to actually just call the agent bridge and they are immediately connected to um, the, um, the observing and whispering and barging in to that um, agent and to that conference. Okay. Recording was very reliable because what we're doing is we're tapping on to the agent conference bridge and actually recording at that level. So we were not passing this recording necessarily across the busy already network, trying to figure out how to get traffic for the set and traffic for the recording to come back to the servers to record. We were doing it locally right there 
uh, at that point at the Meet Me Conference Bridge. Okay. All right, here's the disadvantages we ran into with this. Okay. Scalability. Obviously, if we're going to actually have a bunch of agents connected on an asterisk server to a Meet Me Conference, we are going to eat up a lot of uh, CPU overhead. And so what that would do is that eliminated dramatically at this point when in our development the number of agents we could actually have in one implementation. Because remember, if we're going to go into a call center environment and we do this, we're going to have to make sure that we have the uptime. We're going to have to make sure that um, we, we spec the servers out. And then when the servers are spec'd out, we have to make sure that these servers don't crash because we're overloading the CPU um, with calls and with agent registrations and so forth like that. So, um, you know, the, the Meet Me conference became a big CPU um, hog and it became a big issue there. Um, we also needed to go ahead and um, do call reporting and CDR. We needed to develop that ourselves because obviously if we're not using the routing functionality and, and, the, and the calling functionality of the asterisk server itself, what ends up happening is we don't really have visibility because if we're doing everything through a meet me conference, we don't have visibility of what's happening with that agent, what calls they're taking, what calls they're making, things to that effect. We don't really see that because it's not being done through the standard way asterisk has done that. So we had to develop something ourselves to be able to go ahead and capture this type of information because you're not going to have a contact center without a full reporting suite with the full um, real-time display capability. So we, needed, we knew we needed to develop that piece of it. And, we, and all the logic related to the ACD and the agent login we needed to develop as well too because once again, we're not using the queuing feature of the asterisk. We're not using the routing features of the asterisk. We're using the conference bridge, the meet me bridge. So we had to develop something else to do that in our solution. So, oh. um, what we developed is we call it our N plus one architecture. Right? Um, and what it is, is we actually have what we call our open gate node, our master node. And we developed a solution that we could actually control multiple nodes and, and the control of multiple nodes from one master node. Okay? And so we could get up to um, six nodes currently in, uh, in, in up to, you know, with version 11, that's where we're at right now. Each of the nodes can handle roughly um, two to 300 trunks and a couple of hundred um, agent logins simultaneously, okay? But if you think about that, that's only about 200 agents. That's not quite getting us to the 2,000 we're talking about. So we developed the uh, N plus one architecture with a master node and slave nodes that the master node controls um, a lot of the functionalities um, that um, control what the slave nodes are doing, okay? Um, so we developed uh, an external ACD which, contro which controls all calls and extensions distributed among all the asterisks. That's our, um, that's our master node. Um, our, that's actually our ACD proxy. And then we created what's called a call server which controls all of our asterisk nodes, which is our master node, okay? And when we did this, we developed it to make it look like it's one big system. Six nodes working independently, um, controlled by our master node that allows for all, all the um, management of the six different nodes as they work together and our ACD proxy, which then when the requests came in for calls and so forth, they would actually do all the logical routing, all the call controls, all the presentation to the agents and so forth. Okay? Um, um, uh, configurations were synced using MySQL database, so we could sync the different configurations across the different nodes. Um, we centralized the CDR generated by the ACD. We also could sync all of our audio files for our music on hold, for our RAN messages, for our NQ messages, things to that effect. Um, and we could consolidate all of our recordings by doing this. Um, we also balanced our, um, our SIP registrations as well uh, in this case, we were using open SIPs, and then we, we developed all the, uh, all the routing and the controls into the system using um, um, the AGI and the AMI um, protocols or, 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 or connectivity methods, okay? So what we do and, and how to explain that is we don't really in our implementations allow for the customer themselves to do any manipulation of the asterisk configurations in our environment. We use the AMI, uh, we wrote our software to use the AMI to actually do all configurations through our software interface. So there's really nothing that's being done to the asterisk box 
directly on the Asterisk server itself. It's all through that AMI interface. So we wrote our software to, to set the dialing plan. We wrote our software to set uh, the SIP trunks, everything that we needed to configure through the Asterisk boxes, we wrote using the AMI through our software interface. Same thing with all the controls we were gonna do with the calls, rerouting the calls and so forth. We used the, um, the AGI for that, uh, using those protocols and those interfaces, but our software, overall software, uses that command. We don't, like I said, once again, the, the end user doesn't do any administration of all of, our, of, of the Asterisk boxes. We're strictly, in the, in the strictest sense, we're using it to register trunks and register sets. Everything else is done via our application software. Um, the other thing that we were able to do too, and this, is, this was a big thing as far as we talked about customers that had multiple different voice platforms, we created what we called network regions, which actually would allow these node endpoints to be what we call a network region that would actually, could go and connect to a Cisco here, a Navi over here, a Nortel over here, and so, you know, everything was being done locally, trunks and so forth to that network region. So the agent logins were local to that network region. The trunking connections were local to that network region. And they are all controlled by our master node, okay? Um, and in doing that, we also still could reroute uh, trunking from other nodes across it too. But we had to just, all we had to do in that scenario to make sure that we could separate them geographically like that is make sure we had a certain amount of um, bandwidth throughput and uh, minimum amount of milliseconds be, uh, delay between A and B to make sure that it ran successfully. And so we can create network regions by doing that. Uh, that allows us to go ge geographically redundant across different platforms. So this is kind of the uh, overline of what it looks like in this scenario. So in this scenario, what you have here is you have your master node, open gate master, which controls your slave nodes. Your slave nodes in this case, actually have the um, either TDM or IP trunking to whatever platform you want out there. It's all controlled by our presence server. The database is, is um, a, a customer supplied database. We don't, uh, the, the My, MySQL is part of the actual um, nodes is resident on the nodes, but the actual database of the application itself is either a SQL or an Oracle database, okay? The customer will supply that, we don't supply that. But we, 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 we work with the customer on how to develop that, that database instance for our unique solution, but it's a customer supply database. Um, and then we actually, all of our applications are controlled, every, all the agent controls are done via the desktop. They're not done via the phone. The phone is only used as the voice path. Um, all outbound dialing is done via the desktop, control from the desktop. All inbound calls are done via controls from the desktop. The agent really never touches the phone in our implementation. The phone's there simply for a connection to the headset. And we actually went away from that in some cases as well too, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, but then we can all, allowing, allowing us to do this also allowed us to do other things as well too, is, is now we can incorporate different channels such as web chat, email integration, can all be incorporated into this solution because now it becomes another channel that we can manage through our ACD proxy. Okay, so if we want to take an e a web chat or an email integration, we can actually command the, the node server and the open gate to say that, hey, this agent's not available for this type of call, so we're gonna actually place them in a, a, an email. We're gonna place them in a web chat because we're controlling it at the presence level. So this is the, de this is the design of, of the system um, with our uh, open gate environment, okay? So what can we do in this? Once again, we still have our Avaya-based integration, but we also have our, our um, any PBX integration. We have our OpenGate standalone integration. And now we have also our cloud solution the same way. I will tell you, if you look at our systems, I don't care if it's an Avaya, standalone, whatever, they look exactly the same. Agent interface is the same. Supervisor interface is the same. Same exact look and feel. Programming, with few exceptions, is exactly the same. So you, you, the, the reason we did that, and we'll talk about it in a second, is because if we have a customer out there that started off as a, an Avaya solution, but wanted to move away from the, the heavy cost of the Avaya, they could actually move right into an open gate solution and supervisors and agents wouldn't even know the difference. Um, but with this scenario, we have an agent desktop that, that's common between um, our OpenGate um, PBX standalone solution, we have a web agent 
that is common across all four of our solutions. And then we have now we've developed what's called a WebRTC agent. And that WebRTC agent um, will work with um, any OpenGate product that we have there. The WebRTC doesn't require a SIP registered phone, doesn't require a SIP, uh, a SIP registered soft phone. Everything's done through the browser itself. So all call control, all voice communications back and forth between our application um, and the agent is done via WebRTC. We do that supporting Chrome and Firefox. We can't really do it uh, with um, uh, Internet Explorer because they really don't develop to WebRTC, but we kind of really feel that WebRTC is going to be the future going forward. Now, right now, as it sets, we're not actually using the WebRTC capability out of, um, out of the asterisk boxes because it, at the point we developed this, it really wasn't um, conducive to the way we developed our solution. We'll look at that moving forward to see if that's something we can roll into it to simplify it because this requires us to put a couple extra servers out there. But we are actually using a WebRTC client and what we're doing is we're, our, our WebRTC goes to a server and then we convert to SIP at the asterisk level. And that's how we're, we're doing that communication. Um, so we can do either cloud or prem. Um, if you see how we're doing integrations now, you can see how we can be a perfect cloud solution because for anybody who wants to provide this as a cloud solution, they can just integrate right at um, the network level of the cloud to whatever um, uh, application you're using to provide the voice channels and the voice services to a customer. And so it doesn't, it doesn't sit on prem, it just sits and SIP integrates right at the cloud level. So that's kind of why, why we were doing that. That's why the asterisk piece was so beautiful because we could do anything at any point. And as long as we had that integration between SIP integration between our box and any other server, we could do anything with it. Okay, how did we get to 2,000 seats? Well, in a standard implementation with the six nodes, we can go up to 1,000 seats, 1,600 trunks, simultaneously live at one time. So we can have, a, we can have 1,000 agents running with 1,600 calls either being dialed or in queue or on an agent. Um, in, in a full-blown environment. But that, that extended to the extent of what we could do with the capacity of Asterix and the CPU utilization as it sits today. That's fully tested out. Um, but then we, we, what we did uh, to, to double that size is we created something called a, a unified, uh, unified instance manager that actually will allow you to create two separate instances like that with the management interface on top of it that allows for complete management of both pieces together. There's some, you know, you'll have to do some logical engineering trunks and so forth. But, uh, that, but that's how we get to 2000 through one interface. Um, what were the, um, um, the results of embedding the asterisks? In 2006, we had our first client. Um, we have 160 clients today that are utilizing this. 87% of our new clients are using our OpenGate Asterix version of our product. Um, we allowed the independence we talked about for all, all of our different solutions, uh, for all the different vendors out there. We, we, we actually succeeded in becoming a platform independent product using the Asterix boxes. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're not limited by third party limitations and in, in integrating with them. Um, most of our clients, when we sell them, are standalones, but we do have some integrations to other PBXs out there, but the majority of them do buy this as a standalone system one way or the other. Um, and we, it allows us to, you know, to deliver a, 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 our cloud solution, doing the same thing, using, utilizing the same uh, architecture. And our WebRTC allows us to go truly thin client, which means no phones now, just remote agents no matter where they're at. And we plan on increasing this capability by 20%. Um, we also plan on doing it by creating a, um, instead of two uh, multi-instance um, manager, we're gonna actually develop it to have more than two instances to create the capacity even further. Um, and we're also gonna roll in uh, WebRTC video to the end customer. Now here's where it gets exciting. Understanding how we do this uh, and the ability with the asterisk scenario and, and the different ways we can do this, we could eventually get to the point where we can eliminate the PSTN in call centers. Because if your connection is going to be through 
a web interface through WebRTC connection through into our application, they can just launch the call right from their desktop, right from a soft phone app. We can develop a soft phone application on a smartphone. Everything can be done as just a web connection directly into your contact center. And that's where you'll see a lot of it goes to. You'll see, it's not immediate right now, but you're going to see a lot of different um, people move to that uh, in the future. The ability to get rid of the PSTN, get rid of the dialing plan, be able to embed your contact center into applications as opposed to, oh, dial this number. The application is how you get right into the contact center. You, you, you launch the application, you launch your web page, you launch the web app on your cell phone, and there's a, there's a button there to contact the contact center. And so that's where this is going to. And this, is, this technology is allowing this to happen. And at a high capacity, not just two or three agents supporting it, we're talking thousands of agents supporting this. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty much what, how we got to the point using the Asterix solution and getting to the point of actually um, running you know, a large capacity call center on Asterix solutions. There we go, Paul. Thank you very much for that. And, and I wasn't quite sure what to uh, expect with this presentation, but uh, um, Paul has taken us through what I, I believe is probably the, uh, a textbook way of implementing a large call center using Asterisk. Um, and we had a little chat earlier. I wasn't quite sure how he was going to uh, achieve the scalability to go up to 2,000 seats, but the, the solution there is, is what one would expect, which is where you uh, sit an array of asterisk boxes sitting mm -hmm. behind something like open SIPs in this case, mm -hmm. but it could be Camelio, um yeah. to load balance across all of the um, asterisk boxes. Yeah, and one of the things that we did too on our, on our open gate nodes, our master nodes, is those can be redundant nodes. So they're actually hot, hot redundant nodes. So both of them simultaneously will, con will control all six um, of the actual uh, slave nodes. So if one drops, the other one immediately takes over. But of course, because it's open SIPs or Camelio, that never happens anyway, does it? No, never. No, <laughs> no actually, uh, open SIPs and both open SIPs and Camelio are remarkably reliable. Um, and uh, interesting enough, in, in, in our scenario, we ended up with a very similar architecture, but this is for a, 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 a mobile, mobile VoIP solution. Mm -hmm. But it's the same, same architecture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. Um, the exciting bit is your last couple of slides, where you go in the future. That's right. And this business of all of a sudden, you win a call center, you can lose the PSTN part. Now that is exciting. It is, because if you think about it, you know, everything that's being done today is, is going towards developing applications. You know, everybody talks about Internet of Things, right? So, you know, you think about that, the Internet of Things, they, they could make a phone call, but they're not going to. What they're going to do is they're going to make a data call that's going to come through um, one type of protocol or another, and it's actually going to go ahead and, and update your contact center. Um, it, it's probably, it's not going to call an agent, but it's going to update through your protocols um, to, a, to a, um, a contact that's actually going to be placed to an agent to either do a phone call back or uh, handle it as a, um, some type of contact, even if it's just uh, responding to it and then letting the system actually control um, you know, th what the agent's doing so you have that visibility and that recording capability and so forth. So, but, the, but the bigger thing will be just you, know, you develop a web application, you have a smartphone application, I need to I need to call my bank. I don't have to go on the phone. I can go to my bank's website. I can click a button. I can immediately talk to that bank agent through that application. No, no phone call necessary because you think about it, this, this right here, it's, it's already got a handset. It's already got a microphone. I don't need to actually make it a voice call. It'll become a voice call once it gets to the agent, but it can just be a data um, through your website, convert it, talk to an agent. And think about the cap, especially with the WebRTC, think about the capacity. You could turn it into a video call instantaneously. You can pass a ton amount of data instantaneously. Everything that you looked at, all the information gathered already on the website can immediately be passed. Yeah, that that, that's really important because you, yeah. can, you can actually use the, the web interface and the data channel to pass all the contextual information. So you can, you can have your, your customer actually fill in all the bits and pieces to authenticate, for example, before you get through to the agent. So you mm -hmm. can really dramatically reduce the amount of time that the agent has to set, 
uh, spend on the call by kind of pre-qualifying it and getting the contextual e stuff. E exactly. And one of the other things that we do that's kind of exciting with um, our video piece to it um, is when we initiate a video call, which is a little bit different, is we will actually split the voice and the video once the, once the call comes in, into the system. Because what we can do is once we split the voice and the video, we can actually have the voice go through our intelligent routing tool and actually go through our queuing process, as well as any information from that can actually go and do an automatic lookup to any backend system or CRM, um, and, and it can actually place it. Once it actually places it to the agent, then what we do is the agent answers it, and we automatically mirror that agent, uh, that voice call back up to the video at that point. So it's not an instantaneous video. You don't have to have a person waiting there for a video. You can actually have that video waiting, and we can generate content to the video screen while the agent waits, or while the customer waits, but actually you know, prioritize and queue that call to that agent and mirror them back up again at the end point. So you're not locking what agent's saying, I have to have an agent available for video at all times. You just, like any other agent. Yeah, brilliant. Anyway, we've got two minutes for questions. So has anybody in the audience got any questions? Whilst we've got Paul, and we're lucky to have Paul because he's clearly a very expert in his field. And uh, so has anybody got any questions? You're all stunned. Paul, I think you're going to get away. Well <laughs> yeah, but I, I found that really quite interesting. Thank you. And, uh, and the mo possibly the most interesting thing is where we're going in the future. Where we're going, that's right. Yeah, and uh, there are all kinds of interesting and exciting possibilities, um, which are enabled by things like Respoke and the WebRTC side of things. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so that's great. So um, if, if we have no questions, can we uh, give Paul a, a big round of applause and thanks for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.